Hello and welcome to yet another session of Com Law Ethics and Diversity. Today we move right into strategic communication. Before I get into the central ideas behind strategic com, I'd like to share this quick video with you to prime you for the session. So here we go in terms of what is strategic communication. I think strategic communication is just any way that an organization gets its message out um, for whatever its purpose or goal may be. Strategic communications to me is uh, communicating in a strategic manner what you want to achieve as a business. And it's about positioning the company, positioning the brand, uh, meeting the goals that you want uh, to achieve. It requires some forethought by communicators working with business leaders to make sure that we're all working together, planning together, and implementing together to create some outcomes that benefit the entire organization. Extremists use communications to, to manipulate people and trying to come up with strategies to, to minimize that effectiveness and come up with their own strategies to win the hearts and minds of the vulnerable people who might otherwise be tempted to, to join extremism. Governments tend to be pretty risk averse. And so a lot of innovation is lost when you're not willing to take chances, when you're not willing to um, risk the possibility of failure, um, when you're very concerned about what other people think of you. And um, in, in those cases, I, I think I would like to see governments behaving a little bit more like um, private sector organizations. All right, so there you have it. Strategic Com is diverse and it's also used by governments as equally as it is used by other entities, organizations, and even establishments that are engaged in, I would say, nefarious activities such as terrorist organizations. And so Strategic Com has been around for some time and it has certainly evolved over time. For the purposes of our class, um, I hope that you've already gone through today's reading as it relates to the strategic communication cycle, in terms of all that is involved in strategic comm from an ethical perspective, and the way in which it finds coalescence with news and the, I would say, ethical principles behind news making. There is also the Advertising Agency Federation Code of Ethics I'd like you to make sure that you're familiar with in the context of what it outlines with respect to the ethical principles within the now, persuasive communication as part of what we call strategic com, it's really um, built into the whole menu of informational communication, which we looked at prior to today's session. And so we saw in those sessions that the primary role of the news media, whether in print or broadcast or online, is to create and to produce things that are of an ethical nature. In the context of persuasion itself, if we go over to advertising, we will see that both advertising and public relations really rely heavily on persuasive messages. In fact, the ethical standards and assumptions um, are really different from those in the news business in the sense that um, you know, advertisers do not necessarily have this particular burden of being ethical. Uh, there are assumptions that underlie advertising in the sense that we are rational beings and for the advertiser who will indemnify himself or the company from lawsuits, they will say to the public that it's your particular um, premonition that will determine whether you will buy the particular message, hook, line and sinker, and it really relies on your ability to be rational as a thinker in terms of the message. So advertising really you know, the, the aim or the goal is to sell the product, the service, or the idea. But for the advertising agency or the company, it's all down to the consumer to believe and to buy the message. So that's the reason why the ethical standards and assumptions differ from those in the news, which is purely about giving the truth to the public. Now, in chapter three of your textbook, it talks about both advertising and public relations. But today, we're going to focus only on advertising. 
Now, just to give you some more context, persuasion is as old as communication itself. We know that communication has been in existence for years, but persuasion has also been there in the context of how messages are packaged, whether it's in the context of political communication, persuading the masses to vote, or whether it's in the context of just purely advertising persuasively for consumers to buy a product, a service, or to actually run with an idea. It is all geared towards changing people's beliefs and attitudes and perceptions. And so we talk about the EPL of persuasion, which is the ethics, not just the ethics, but the ethos or the credibility that person's particular personality they're bringing to the whole process. The P being the pathos or the emotion. And of course, the L being the logic or the proof that you're bringing to that particular um, persuasion that consumers or audiences may be exposed to. So the ethos, pathos, and logos will always undergird any persuasive message. And most of you who would have done, you know, intro to public speaking, this was part of your particular menu of output in terms of bringing ethos, pathos, and logos to the whole process. So it's your personality, the ability to bring emotion, and of course, proof or evidence, particularly since you're trying to shift people's beliefs and attitudes that may be embedded in their psyche for years and what we call cognitive dissonance, whereby people will just weed out everything that does not coincide with what their beliefs are, but they will take that which really reflects their existing ideas and ideals. And so Aristotle really is the guy behind, you know, persuasion. He was really that Greek philosopher who developed the theory of how argumentation is shaped. And he said that the goal really of persuasion is to convince an audience that your point is valid or correct. So validity is always enmeshed in credibility in terms of that particular message. Now, advertising is the foundation of our capitalist democratic society. U.S. society is built around feeding our appeals, feeding our needs and our emotions with everything that has to sell. So the advertiser will sell you to tell you and sell you the idea that you need a new house, you need a new car, you need to have a certain body type. Um, all of these things are to whet your appetite so that that's how the wheels of capitalism will keep turning. You need to eat the McDonald's, you need to do everything. And it's usually that toss up between the needs versus the wants. And in most cases, they create the want as if it's a need. And so that's the reason why advertising really is what oils the machinery of a capitalist society such as the US. And of course, democracy really tells us that we have multiple options from which to actually choose when we're actually checking to see exactly what's available to us in the context of the advertising information and message. Now, what are the functions of advertising? It fulfills a number of important functions, and these include information about goods and services. It promotes businesses, which supports the economy, and it also helps to fund news and entertainment media. That's the reason why when you're looking at the newscast, you will notice that one third of the newscast will be advertisements, commercials, because the commercials will sell, even if they recognize that there's not going to be a whole lot in terms of the content, 30 seconds, they know that there's a captive audience at a certain prime time. And so they will pay for the spot because they would have already received the return on their investment based on the number of consumers who are exposed to the message and who are likely to buy when they particularly um, see that ad and they want to spring off their couches immediately to buy the product or the service, all right? So funding news and entertainment media, you will find the ads inside there because it serves that particular purpose. Now, you will see here that the most common consumer tribes, we are among those, college students and teachers, followed by, of course, you know, you have the military and seniors, but you have 235 million worldwide in terms of college students who are there, who are actually, you know, targeted for ads. And so the spending power here is put at 593 billion. Um, of course, advertisers will advertise to you before you enter college to tell you which one is the best. Um, you know, for teachers, it will tell them exactly what professions to actually go into, what resources to get. And of course, the military, those who are in active duty or retirement, you will see that a whole lot of the ads are actually pivoted towards recruitment 
and the like. And of course, seniors, there's always some kind of product or service that seniors are usually targeted to actually buy. And this is what you call the most common consumer tribes. We are part of this tribe of the consuming society that help to feed into the functions of advertising. Now, there are a couple of critics who have said that it's not all good in as much as we're supposed to be rational beings where advertising is concerned. It is seen as unethical and exploitative. And the image here really illustrates the fact that a child in and of you know, himself or herself or themselves, children will not necessarily be the ones to rationally think about, you know, I don't think the burger or that particular sandwich is good for my health. Um, so children will in their, invariably be pulling at their, the heartstrings of their parents and they will say, you know what, I need that. And so when the advertisers target the children, the children will target the parents and the parents will feel guilty. They do not necessarily go in the direction of making the actual purchase. So the exploitative nature of advertising has been criticized in the past because many people feel um, that it relies too much on stereotypes. It also glorifies consumerism. It neglects communities. And of course, it refuses to take responsibility for its effects on individuals, especially children. And I'd like to dwell on this last point for a moment. If advertisers are not taking responsibility for obesity and for all of the different types of ways in which social media is drawing children in, then something has got to be desperately wrong with the society that we're living in, in the sense that children are not necessarily rational thinkers at their age. If advertising is neglecting communities, it means that you have communities that are vulnerable, communities that are not necessarily, um, you know, seized of the opportunities to do certain things economically. And so you're just marginalizing one set of people versus another set. If it's glorifying consumerism, it means that we're a society that just really lives based on anything that is materialistic. And of course, stereotypes as it relates to rich, rich versus poor, um, deserving versus undeserving, minority versus those who are in, in the upper echelons of society and the like. So these are the points of contention when it comes to how critics see uh, the role of advertising as, a, as unethical and exploitative at the same time. Now, strategic communication as a field, it has largely replaced PR and advertising in the sense that strategic com, as you would have seen in the opening video, really takes into account that way in which governments utilize media to make sure that they're controlling the narratives and con controlling the image that they're putting out there for the public to see. It is the way in which companies have really fostered and engaged PR specialists to be strategic about their responses to crises, be strategic about their, their 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 presence in society in terms of being corporate socially responsible and all of those terms that are associated. So it's not necessarily being reactive, but it's being proactive from a strategic perspective. And so the question is, does client advocacy or client advocate mean consumer advocacy? And this is the question that really emerges from the reading when it comes to the role of communication from a strategic perspective um, in terms of its um, relationship with people. Now, we know that strategic com really is targeting people's behaviors, and that is very, very pervasive in the sense that every time somebody clicks, there's an issue where they're clicking, and of course, they're getting to that particular product. In some cases, the algorithms will be the, 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 the particular thing that will lead us from one page to another, and we don't necessarily want to be doing that um, in, in our own private spaces. So because behavioral targeting is very, very pervasive in society, it really creates a conundrum for consumers to remain very private. And so alternatives to, um, you know, con con counteracting this invasiveness of technology would be, you know, Yelp and DuckDuckGo where you can actually browse and nobody's seeing the algorithm or developing it in such a way that they're following your search um, patterns or your algorithms so that they can be selling you products or services continuously. All right. Some problems there would include fake ads. And of course, truth is always compromised when it comes to strategic com because everybody now is evolving and emerging into uh, product developers and they're advertising in a false way 
because they want you to read on. There have been a couple of instances where celebrities have actually, um, you know, filed lawsuits against advertisers because in some cases you will see an ad popping up um, so long to Whoopi Goldberg or goodbye or fans will miss X or Y person. When in fact, that is not the focus of the ad, but they want you to go to some particular site to buy a product or a service or to consider an idea. So they use a clickbait and they use a celebrity to actually promote that sale or that potential bait for the customer or the consumer who will click on that particular link. So these are some problems that exist when it comes to strategic communication. Now, the issue of the advertising effects really it has always been something that is contentious in society. And so many advertising executives, they take a caveat emperor attitude, let the buyer beware. And so sometimes you will find that the thoughts around our rationality and being able to evaluate things, that's very questionable because not everyone in society is able to evaluate things rationally for themselves. But the advertisers have argued, they've long argued that we are responsible for our reactions to what we consume and what we see on television or online. And so if advertising persuades some people to live beyond their means, the advertisers are arguing that that's your problem. That is not our problem. You've got to decide for yourselves because they're thinking that they're not babysitters or parents, but this has been critiqued as unethical and purely unprincipled for that very weak consumer. Now let's look at corporate social responsibility. What is corporate social responsibility? This is really an, an alternative approach to the role of advertising in society, and it involves the idea of corporate responsibility or a system in which the role of advertising is to empower multiple stakeholders, including businesses and the public. So if a company wants to have favor and goodwill in the public, they will go out there and they will just perhaps contribute some sort of funds to maybe the businesses or the schools and the community to talk about how they are responsible, how they are very concerned and how they're very involved um, in the development of the youth in a community. So that is corporate social responsibility. But they're branding at the same time and they're putting their stamp on that particular activity or entity at the same time. And that is corporate social responsibility that is really not necessarily purely developmental on behalf of the people, but it's really that way of positioning oneself as an agency or as a company, and it's called corporate social responsibility. In some cases, it may be them putting a bench in a community or putting a strip or putting a pathway to walk or some sort of cycle pathway, but their brand is there, all right? In, in as much as it means pretty well, it means well for them to be present in that community, it is also their way of branding and putting a mark or a stamp on that particular activity or a particular pathway. Now, under this approach of corporate responsibilities, they're not expected to ignore the needs of the business side of their companies, but they're expected to take into account the needs of the consumers. So while they're thinking about the fact that we need to walk more, the fact that children need to read more and they're contributing to the reading clubs, they're making sure at the same time that you're acknowledging their contributions to that particular field of development, all right? Now, proponents of CSR, or corporate social responsibility, um, they assume that advertising can be a positive social force that fosters community. And we can see this if there is consistent CSR in communities that will, will sponsor um, literacy programs, because you can see in the end that there is a progression in terms of the way in which students our children were not able to read before, and as a result of the uptakes or the sponsorship of that particular agency, there is now this particular, um, I would say, effort to make sure that the improvements are seen all around in the child's performance at school. So instead of leaving the underserved behind, advertising really can work to reflect diverse voices and improve their lot. Meaning that if you've got underserved communities, that they can improve their lot through what corporate social responsibility will do for them. But all of that may sound good. There's a critique that says that it's unrealistic and overly burdensome for some advertisers who may think that it's just too much for them to be spending. Now, we hear about the tears test. The text tells us about the tears test, and this was developed by proponents of the corporate responsibility approach to advertising. 
it is really an ethical test for advertisements that can also be used to evaluate any persuasive message used in strategic communication. And what the TIRS test is, is that it includes a series of questions. If the answer to each one is yes, then the persuasive message effectively passes the test. Let's look at the TIRS test. The T is really for truthfulness. And if you're looking at advertising, the TIRS test really calls upon us to actually check to see whether the messages claims are both verbal and visual and completely truthful in the way in which they're brought over. And on the screen, you will see this image about someone being able to become wrinkle-free within one hour. Is that even truthful? Have you ever considered the ads and have you ever tested the ads that you're getting in the sense that there is no truthfulness involved? Is the message free from any omissions that could be deceptive? And this is where advertisers are really coming into calling, you know, coming into question as it relates to the ethical nature of the claims that they're making about truthfulness and the authenticity. And the authenticity which comes on the A has to do with do the appeals in the message authentically reflect the reality of the intended audience? Is the message free from stereotypical and insulting images? You would recall, some of you may recall that particular incident involving a little child with the monkey um, for that, that, that particular company that was um, really called into question in terms of its intent of the original message. I believe there was some type of, uh, I would say, pushback and they issued um, uh, an apology. And so that's really one of the ways in which you might find that messages are not necessarily free from stereotypical and insulting images. There is also that particular message where the young man went into the washing machine black and came back out white or very light in complexion. That's really an insulting image as well. So it's not just the H and M controversy to which I'm referring that really causes us to question the authenticity of the message in terms of its stereotypical nature, but it's messages around fading and bleaching and cleanliness that are really meant to be stereotypical when they're not necessarily taking into account those particular existing ideations behind what is pure and what is not. And the target audience as well, based on the insults that may be perceived from those messages. Then we come to the R in the tier sets. And this is where I spoke about respect because really authenticity speaks to stereotypical and insulting images, but then the R speaks to respect. And this image is about the exact particular uh, message that I spoke about earlier. Does the message show respect for those whom it is intended? Does the communicator respect the receiver enough to take full, open and public responsibility for the content of the message? And this here is the young man who was actually there um, in the context of that particular H&M t-shirt in terms of what they were actually saying in that ad, all right? Like I said, there was an apology issued in terms of what was illustrated or depicted um, for this particular young man. Now we come to the E in the test, and this has to do with equity. Is the recipient of the message on the same level playing field as the message's creator? Will the average receiver be able to correctly interpret the message? Um, you know, there's a question there next to the cartoon and it says, let's give our kids a healthy future. And the kid is saying, see mom, normal people get to eat those tasty snacks five times an hour. So if you're targeting an audience that is mixed, and the audience includes those who are barely making it in life, who can barely have two meals a day, and you're trying to say that you can all eat healthy square meals, then you're not necessarily taking into account that the society that you're living in, it's inequitable where the distribution of wealth is concerned and where people's well-being is concerned in the context of affordability, all right? So equity across messages, they have to be taken into account as part of the tears test. And of course, I'm sure you would agree with me that quite a few ads will not pass the tears test as it relates to equity as a result of how consumerism sometimes is driven based on the haves versus the have-nots. Now, apart from the equity in the tears test, we come to the S, which is uh, the need to be socially responsible. And this begs the question, if everyone who is financially able to purchase this product or services 
did so, or service did so, and used it, would society as a whole be improved? And I've got the picture here of the Tesla. We know that the argument is that you're going to lower emissions if you have an electronic um, a, a vehicle that is powered by electricity and, and the like. But how is society generally going to benefit from this? Do we still need um, energy coming from, from fossil fuels? Uh, do we still need industry that you know is usually powered by fossil fuels as a result of, 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 of promoting Tesla? And is everyone able to afford Tesla, um, a, a, an electric vehicle in the first place? And I'm stumbling there to say to you that it is over and above social responsibility. I believe that if we think about Tesla in the context of every single thing else in the tears test, we might think about Tesla in the context of equity. Can anyone honestly afford an, elect an electric vehicle? All right. So it forces us to really think through the tears test in the context of what we were talking about before, the utilitarian look at how um, we might view things in society and how it benefits the whole and how lives will be improved a whole lot. Now, persuasion and responsibility, according to Hodges, 1986, um, you know, there are a couple of sources of responsibility. And Hodges says that first, there is the assigned source of responsibility, meaning that we are responsible um, to the employer. Then there's the contractual source of responsibility based on an agreement where you're supposed to or you expect that you are paying your fees. Um, this is an example, and the agreement is that you're going to be taught. Then there's the self-imposed source of responsibility where we are defining our moral perimeters in terms of what we think is right or wrong or ethical in society. And so these are some sources of responsibility that we may encounter every single day as consumers that which we are responsible for in terms of the hours that we will put in on the job, that which we are going to do, um, you know, the, the activities we will engage in based on that particular contractual agreement, and that which is morally defined, whereby we set standards and we determine what is good or bad for our own lives, ethically speaking. Now, let's look at the advertising um, agencies of America, the code of ethics. And if you are actually considering um, being someone who is going to be veering off into advertising, it's very important that you understand how these principles will apply to your life, not just for the ethical code of conduct that you will bring um, to the class, or I would say to the whole process as a result of what you will do um, for your code of conduct, your ethical standards that you will um, derive, but I think also when you get into the agency, you might want to look to see to what extent these particular codes are manifested in practical terms or in practice. Now, principle number one speaks to advertising, public relations, marketing, communications, news, and editorials. They all share a common objective, which is truth and high ethical standards in serving the public. So if you recognize that there is no truth, or there is no high ethical standard in serving the public, then we know that something is definitely wrong in that particular entity or establishment. The second principle speaks to advertising public relations and all marketing communications professionals who have an obligation to exercise the highest personal ethics in the creation and dissemination of commercial information to consumers. So just as much as news establishments, news reporters, have an, an obligation to uphold truth in terms of their particular output. So do advertising, public relations, and all communication professionals in terms of personal ethics in the dissemination of commercial information to consumers. It means that those who engage in advertising and packaging advertising and public relations should strive to make sure that they're giving the public the truth and nothing but the truth. Now, principle number six, and you, you do have access to all of the principles, but I've just called a couple of them to highlight these principles. It says that advertisers should never compromise consumers' personal privacy in marketing communications and their choices as to whether to participate in providing their information should be transparent and easily made. This basically means that no one should be forced to actually talk about a product without really giving consent to that particular product, all right? And then principle number eight speaks to the fact that advertisers and their agencies and online and offline media should discuss 
privately potential ethical concerns, and members of the team creating ads should be given permission to express internally their ethical concerns. This basically implies a serious nature of if you have an advertising agency, a creative shop, if someone has a concern who's part of that creativity about the truthfulness of the message, about their discomfort, about what the message means for those who are hearing the message and who may believe it. And if the person knows that it's not the truth, then they have a right to voice that particular concern internally as a result of their particular ethical um, dilemma that they may be facing as someone as part of the creative shop. Now, for the full um, code of ethics, go to the Institute of Advertising Ethics. Um, you will see the full list of ethical principles. And of course, the list is also available online in detail under today's module.